Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE, covering EMC World 2015. Brought to you by EMC, Brocade, and VCE. from Las Vegas, I'm Dave Vellante. David Goulden is here, he's the CEO of EMC. David, welcome to theCUBE, great to see you again. Dave, great, thank you. Thanks for being here, day three, fantastic well, show. Our pleasure, day one, yours was a big keynote, you led things off this year. First of all, how do you feel? And uh, then let's get into the keynote. Oh sure, no thanks Dave. I think, actually I feel great. Um, this year, about 14,000 people, roughly the same size as last year, which I think is good. You know, because more companies are having uh, you know, travel restrictions and things like that, but so to have a big crowd, I feel great. I think the buzz this year is great. I think the message is really making sense with customers, and it's also, we're seeing all the work we've done together for the last few years coming together in terms of the message to customers, the way that we've organized, the way we're bringing solutions to market, so feel great. Well, and you were, if not the architect, certainly one of the key architects of the whole federation model. It's one of your areas of expertise, is, is actually thinking about how to organize, very important things, and we maybe, maybe have some time to talk about that, but a lot of talk about the digital economy, the digitization of companies, right. it's sort of a new theme that you guys are, are talking about. Where did that come from? Um, was that part of the new conversations that you're having with C-level executives? Did the Federation enable that? I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. It, it, it does, Dave. This, this whole concept of the digitization of business, I mean, this is the huge shift that we're talking about that's going to disrupt industries. Um, and that's where we talk about platform three and things that uh, customers have to lean into to transform to become part of the information economy because if they don't, they're going to get left behind and maybe go out of business. I mean, this is really at the core of where companies are facing their strategy and their direction. So that's a concept that we've been obviously working on for a few years. You see uh, us doing things like creating Pivotal for building those new applications. You see us doing things on my side of the business to build infrastructure for data sets that could be a million times larger than the data sets in the traditional platform two business. So this concept of digital transformation is a business imperative. It's, it's an issue for the boardrooms, and you see it being an issue in the C-suite of every company that we speak to. So, you talk about platform two, you talk about platform three, and the big issue for CIOs is how do I go from where I am today to where I want to go in the future without disrupting and ripping and replacing? And you've come up with this notion of platform 2.5. Right. It's relatively new this year, uh, so talk about that a little bit. And what is Platform 2.5? Yeah, I think that's a real, as we refine our strategy um, to try and help people understand what we're doing, this concept of Platform 2.5 resonates because the simplistic view of the world is that you've got your existing client server apps in Platform 2, you want to save costs there, and you want to move budget across to spend on Platform 3, which is your new, your, your new digital world. And that's a great message to 50,000 feet, but you can't do much with that because Obviously platform three is a transformation agenda, but the way you want to actually save money in platform two is also to transform. It's not just by trying to do everything you're doing today a little bit less expensively. It's to really take a transformational approach to taking some of those key technologies that are going to be the drivers of platform three, um, things like fully software, software uh, defined self-service provisioning, cloud capabilities, and using that to build a transformational platform for your existing apps. So it's the application that defines the platform. The applications are platform two apps, and when you modernize those through a modern cloud infrastructure, that's really platform 2.5. The app is still the same, but the whole infrastructure it's running on and how it's provisioned and managed is different. So it's less expensive, it's faster, it's more secure, and it's more agile, and that's platform 2.5. Those same attributes, you absolutely need them in platform three, but the breakthrough in kind of our, expla our explanation of the strategy is really to get people to understand you've got to transform platform two not just cost reduces. Cost reduction is one of the outcomes, it's not the only outcome. So platform three, a lot of those apps are sort of on the edge. It's, it's maybe hard to generate enough business to offset sort of the decline of the older stuff. It's platform 2.5 from your standpoint, is that a way to allow from EMC's perspective so that you don't over rotate, in, for example, into, into platform three? So in other words, can you do more transactions around platform 2.5 and I mean, direct, direct real revenue? Yes, I think that's a pragmatic part of it, Dave. If I look at enterprise spending, true enterprise IT spending, it's probably today in the 80 to 90% range on platform two technologies. And enterprises in general, established enterprises are spending probably 10, 15% on platform three. So uh, no company can just go uh, like, like ourselves and go entirely in, in, into platform three. That's the future, but it's a balance. So 
companies will spend more money on platform two and platform 2.5 apps in total over the next few years than they will on platform three. It's interesting, nobody really knows when that will become 50-50 inside enterprise, it's probably five years out, um, which means a lot of the spend dollars is still in transforming platform two. A lot of the spend growth is in platform three. Platform 2.5 is a way to have a transformation agenda for the platform two apps as well as a transformation agenda for platform three. So a large company like yours that is in the midst of an industry transition like this, you always run the risk of trying to protect the past from the future. The story of Extreme IO is quite interesting. You, you go out, you, you pay a you know, fair amount for this company with no revenue. No revenue. You bring this company <laughs> in, it takes a long time, I mean, relatively long time in IT months. terms. 18 months. 18 months to yep. get it right, and then all of a sudden the thing starts taking off. Um, well, first question is, are, are you surprised by the rate of the ascendancy? Um, I'm sure you're pleased by it, but are you surprised pleased. by it? I wouldn't say I'm surprised, we're very pleased. Um, we knew that that was a, um, in some ways a disruptive technology, but again, it fits beautifully into my platform two, platform 2.5 example. Extreme IO is an all flash array, it's a block storage device, and it plugs into a storage area network, or a SAN. So it does the same kind of things that we've been doing for years with a VMAX, a, a VNX, a, 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 and that class of, of technology. So it's going into an existing market and doing things better. Um, the applications that people are running are things like, um, uh, VDI, virtual servers, now transactional databases, things that are running in their data center today. Maybe the new app will be VDI, but it's still basically a platform to 2.5 type app. So it was a product which is a transformational technology, but it fits into a selling motion and into a customer buying pattern that exists across our entire business. So with the right product at the right time um, in the right marketplace, and we've seen just exponential growth of it. So, um, Am I surprised? Honestly, no, we had aspirations for something this aggressive. Am I pleased? Absolutely. But you've got this cash cow of, of VMAX and, and, and VNX, and when that product, Extreme IO, became available, the tone of the company seemed to change. You're really going hard after it. You've always said it's better to eat your own than it is right. to somebody else. Eat, you know, but if I heard it right on the earnings call, about a third of the demand for Extreme IO is going into existing, I think it was VMAX accounts, is that right? No, let me clarify, Dave. It's yeah. actually, We've done a lot of work to see where those um, extreme IO systems are going, clearly, because uh, we do expect certain parts to cannibalize our existing business. And what we found is a third of the systems are going into existing EMA, EMC accounts for workloads that are running on either a VMAX or a VNX today. So a combination of both, not just um, v VMAX. A third are going into EMC existing customers for new workloads. It could be something like a VDI, or they're putting in a new high performance database on their block system, and they're using it for that. And then a third is going into brand new accounts for us. So we're opening a lot of new customers for the EMC family. So what we're finding is only a third of those sales are cannibalistic compared to what we have in, 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 the, in the customer footprint today, and two thirds are basically expanding our footprint. And you talk a lot about the install base. The install base is maintaining of the, the traditional systems, right? Yeah, particularly what we watch very carefully is our install base of VMAX systems, because VMAX for a number of years has been our flagship. Obviously with VMAX 3 coming along, we've done a major re-architecture of that system. Uh, launched it last fall, restarted shipping it. The late part of last year, now it's kind of fully transitioning across. So we watch the install base of those systems like a hawk, because um, that is our high-end uh, our flagship storage system. And as I said, the interesting thing is that despite the fact that we're actually consolidating often when you put a VMAX 3 in, you may consolidate two or three VMAX 2s onto one VMAX 3, it's so much more powerful. The total install, the total number of installed VMAX has remained relatively constant over the last few, few quarters, which means we are putting them in not just to consolidate, but we're also putting them in for some new application environments as well. So you've got this traditionally 60% plus gross margin business. Uh, I presume the flash can be as productive as from a margin standpoint. Is that, is that a fair assessment? It's actually quite interesting. The, the margin, what we do externally is we show people what's happening to our VMAX revenues, because that's very important. Right. Um, and then we do a, um, a bucket which we call unified and backup recovery, and another segment called our emerging storage uh, platforms. And you and put there, Extreme IO in there, in even there. though We've it's not organizationally. Even though it's not, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to do it from a revenue point. Yeah, we'll okay. talk about how we organize in just a minute. But in, ex in that third category, Extreme IO's in there, Iceland's in there, Software Defined Storage's in there, uh, SRM's in there, uh, so our, our new suites. And the gross margin profile of those three broad buckets is very close to, to each other, within a couple of points. So what you've seen is as the mix shift, 
in our business occurred, and, and it occurred quite rapidly last year because of the uh, VMAX transition. The mix shift revenue went from a large chunk of revenue from a mixed point of view went from symmetrics into merging. You saw our gross margin profile was very um, steady during that period of time, which is good, which means that we can afford to really go at this aggressively because we want to move as much, as, well, we want to obviously grow as fast as we can in all three buckets, but we know that the real hyper growth is going to come from the emerging storage bucket. Yeah, and I presume you, well, let me ask you, I presume you don't micromanage gross margins. You try to add value, you try to compete, get fair pricing, and yeah, I mean, gross know, let the market is, decide. Right? It is an outcome, exactly. Yeah. It's an outcome. In fact, quite honestly, yeah. the way I think gross margin, it's a function of value add. Yeah. Right, so it's simply how much value are you adding compared to, because we're obviously selling appliances, we're buying commodity components for all those appliances, whether they're a VMAX or a VNX or even an Extreme IO, and the gross margin is simply a function of what the market will, will bear for the technology you put on top of those commodity components. Right. So what's the software worth, what's the distribution system worth, what's your sales and support team, what's your, what's your support system worth to the company? Yeah, so I've been following this business for a long time, and ever since I've been in this business, there's been margin pressures <laughs> on, on hardware. And the reason I'm asking all these questions is, as we shift to a software-defined world, Will the margin model look like a software-defined, the software margin well, model? Is that a good software, thing? Soft, software gross <laughs> margins are a very good thing. Um, you know, we have a great software company inside of, of our federation called VMware. Look at their gross margins. You know, pretty close to 80%. Uh, whereas if you look at a, a typical systems company, you know, margins are more in the 50s. And obviously, if it's a commodity hardware company, the margins are even less than that. And by systems, I mean, look at something like our storage business, you, you see have low 50s points of gross margin, which is great because you've got a blend of hardware and software in there. As we go forward, and the world moves to software defined, there's a chance for margins to expand if, if all the value goes into software. But, I keep on telling people, even if you have software defined storage, you got to buy the hardware from somebody. And what we have found is that customers, because of who we are, often look to us to provide the solution, not just the software. So they want choice. So we'll give software-defined storage that can run on any hardware, but then a lot of customers want us to come back and supply the system in the software-defined world, just like they did in the more closely coupled appliance world of Platform 2. All right, let's talk about VCE. VCE is now part of, uh, of EMC. That's it changes or, you know, organization. Obviously, your, your go-to-market is I guess cleaner. Uh, it changes the accounting, I, I presume, right? It um, does. So, so talk about the uh, reintegration or integration of VCE and what that's meant for you guys. Um, Dave, we are delighted. I mean, that is something that we have been planning for a while. Um, integrations are always a little challenging, particularly when you go from a company that was very much set up as a joint venture structure with its own identity, now a fully owned division. So the division has stayed intact, so we've integrated as a division side of EMC. But it's great um, from a couple of points of view. First of all, it's the market lead in converge infrastructure. When it's in a joint venture, you have a certain amount of access to the expertise when you own it. We got 2,000 people, we came into EMC with VCE who are experts at designing, um, building, selling, supporting CI, and that has proven really valuable. Secondly, you've got much more control over the destiny. So you saw us introduce VX Rack. That was the big announcement of day one at EMC World. That is a hyper-converged data center architecture that we and that leverages the VCE expertise, it leverages the rest of EMC as well. And that's something that we've designed and brought to market since we've had uh, VCE inside the company. Yeah, so, and it's a multi-billion dollar business. I, I, don't, I don't know if, you know, I think you guys have done forecasts for 15, but we've said it's probably three billion. Um, I think you've made some comments on the size of the business looking back. Yeah, we said the business dollar. was basically a $2 billion run rate business yeah. in the fourth quarter. Now obviously the fourth quarter is always yeah, the biggest yeah, okay. quarter. But so that's the public number, yeah. two, two billion run rate in the fourth the quarter. Last year, yeah. And you're a leader in that space, so obviously very happy with the progress. It was really interesting because a lot of people said, oh, VCE, crazy, crazy, crazy. Not so crazy. Not so crazy. <laughs> I mean, Dave, VCE, people, there's, there's much more to converge infrastructure than just the technology behind it. Obviously, mm -hmm. a lot of technology goes into creating a system called a V-Block, much more than just the some of the parts of the components. There's the whole management and orchestration layer. There's something called Vision, which VCE built, so you've got a single point in management. But also what we do is, once the system has gone in, we help the customer manage all the upgrades to that system in a very controlled way. So essentially, they get lifecycle infrastructure management from us. 
It's not just buying a system, it's buying a whole different approach to your infrastructure. And it's a tool for transformation. So back to my theme, you got to transform in platform two to save money to improve um, your speed and time to market as a company, you got to transform in platform three to build your business a different way. It's a transformation vehicle. And as I say, it did very well. It grew over 30% in the first quarter. Off, obviously now what is becoming a big number from an installed base point of view. I'm very confident about the future of that business. So you guys, again, you use this platform two, two and a half, three sort of metaphor. It's a, it's a guiding force for your strategy, clearly. How does your organization line up to that vision? Well, it's actually helped us align the strategy, um, the communication with customers, and how we've organized. So what we did about a year ago, um, really getting focused on this, is we created internally inside of my business in the infrastructure space two R&D divisions. One, the core technology division, which includes everything with Platform 2 and Platform 2.5, including Extreme IO. So you've got all of our block storage arrays in there. Um, you've got the backup recovery portfolio. Um, and then we created another group called Emerging Technologies, which is really focused entirely upon Platform 3. So we recognize that whilst there's going to be some common elements across these two worlds, like a data lake where you've stored data from both sides, you've got to recognize the applications are so different, you've got to build the infrastructure from the ground up to support different classes of applications. So we have, about a year ago, organized against this strategy as well. So not only is it how we communicate to customers, not only is it how we talk about how we want to transform their business, it's how we're transforming our business. So we've got those core two groups, and then now, if you like, in between them, or well, in the middle of them, we got VCE, where we're taking those technologies and building them into VBlocks. So the two core technology groups are building best of breed storage systems, storage solutions, backup recovery technology um, to have leadership in our storage substrate. And then with, um, with VCE, we can take those and turn them into complete converged infrastructure systems. Yeah, okay, and and then the services organization stays pretty much intact as it as And it was. the services org stays intact, and the sales and go-to-market org stays intact, except what's interesting is for a number of years we've built specialties in those groups as well. So essentially we now have a specialty sales force inside of VCE that is the sales expert at CI that now basically um, works with and alongside our core sales force that handles customers and partners, et cetera. So the model, the model plugs together very seamlessly. I tweeted out during your keynote that you had uh, essentially architected uh, the greatest acquisition in the history of the, the technology business, obviously meaning VMware. I know you played a big role in it, others as well, so certainly got to give Joe some credit. <laughs> and, Joe, uh, a lot of credit. <laughs> <laughs> pulling the trigger. Uh, and somebody tweeted back, well, how about Apple's acquisition of Next? They said, okay, touche, that's good. We'll give that you know, number one, you're number two. But the, the reason I'm, I'm going here is, when I think about your career at EMC, you've done, I don't know, how many acquisitions? Over 50, easily. I've been involved in many yeah. acquisitions okay. here, yeah. A lot. And you've seen an evolution of, of, of those acquisitions. How would you describe the, your capabilities, EMC's? I mean, it's clearly matured. EMC was not always the great acquirer of companies that it is now. And how, how has that matured, and, and, and how have you perfected that, and how do you see that perfecting going forward and changing going forward? I think it's, I think it's, it's matured into a huge advantage for us. Uh -huh. um, when you look at the companies that we have um, bought over the years, obviously VMware, legendary, but look at the acquisitions on closer to my side of the business, things like Isilon, um, Data Domain, et cetera. Not only have we bought the companies and successfully integrated them, we've grown them faster after we bought them than they were growing before. And we've retained key members of the leadership team from each of those companies because our model it's not a one size fits all model. That's one thing that, that we learned, that you need to understand the mission of the application of, of the acquisition, how close it is to your core, if it's a market extension, a business extension, a product extension, and then how you go at integrating it is different in the, each of those scenarios. So we've done a good job of understanding that and having situation specific playbooks for bringing these companies in. We've also recognized that in some cases you want to do a reverse integration. So in the case of uh, our backup recovery business, we took the assets we had inside of EMC, we, re we reverse integrated them into data domain to create that business. Right. Um, so that's one thing that, that we've learned. Now of course in recent years, we've learned a different skill as well because as we mentioned up front with Extreme IO, as you're buying either platform 2.5 emerging or platform free technologies, we've now developed a skill set of buying companies that are pre-revenue. That's a whole different skill set. It's one thing to buy a company that's maybe at 100 or 200 million dollars of revenue, bring it in and accelerate 
that sales process to buy a company like um, what we've done with Extreme IO, Scale IO, DSSD, mm. maybe a year to two years before revenue to nurture it is a whole different skill set. So what you do there is you basically insulate that business, you protect it, you give it the resources that, that, that it needs, but you basically tell the rest of the company to leave it alone for time being because it's got a mission in place. It's got the mission to build a product that it can bring to market, but also it's got a mission to build a product that EMC can bring to market because that's a whole different standard. When customers expect a new EMC product, they expect it to be mission critical, world class, supported globally, whereas if you're a standalone startup, you get a pass on those. If the product comes out and it's okay and it, you know you can't support it around the world, people will give a startup a break on that. They won't give us a break on that. Mm -hmm. So we have to not only bring a company in that's maybe 18 months to yeah, two years yeah. before revenue, we got to make sure when it hits the market, it's ready to, to scale. So we have done things like we have develop beyond the beta phase, we develop things like a early availability program and then a pre-GA revenue program. Mm -hmm. So when we go GA, we say that product is available globally, it really is. David, I know you're super busy. I wish we had more time. Oh, David, so many other great. things I want Thank to talk you. to you about. Uh, David Goulden, outstanding organizational executive, uh, execution uh, pro at the heart of EMC's execution ethos. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Delighted like to be with you. All right, Thanks keep a lot. right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is the Cube. We're live from EMC World. Right back.